My name is Shelley Schuster. I'm the president of Keck Graduate Institute, and I'm uh, thrilled to be joined on the podcast today by Peter Saltonstall, the president and chief executive officer of the National Organization for Rare Disorders, also known as NORD. Uh, Peter joined NORD in 2008 after having served for more than 30 years as a senior executive in both for-profit and not-for-profit healthcare environments. Uh, I would like to point out before we get started that it's a special thrill to be able to uh, talk to Peter uh, in the first one of these podcasts because it gives us an opportunity, I think, to emphasize how important for us it is to understand the patient. And I don't think there's an organization in the country that more thoroughly and deeply represents the interests and will and needs of the patient than the National Organization for Rare Disorders. So just for a little bit of background, if you'll forgive me for giving it, Peter, instead of of letting you do it, uh, but Nord really was the the originator of the Orphan Drug Act uh, and forged relationships between the patient community and the executive branch, Congress, Uh, Health and Human Services, uh, FDA, NIH, Social Security, and Center for Medicaid Services, as well as drug companies, device companies, uh, and the entire medical, academic, and investment communities. It's really been a pivotal organization in building all of these relationships and and, uh, building the consensus around how we help people with with rare disorders. Peter is one of the, the most prominent voices in the United States on the rare disease issues to the industry, FDA, Congress, and the government. So, Peter, uh, we're thrilled to have you here at KGI. Can you start off by giving us a bit of background and history behind NORD? Um, let me say that it started back by, with a mom who had a child with Tourette's syndrome uh, 35 years ago. Her name was Abby Myers, and she basically um, had a son who was on a therapy that was produced by a company that um, – made the decision that they were going to stop producing it because the market was too small and the economics didn't work for them. And so she was left with a son who had a therapy that was really, it it made him um, be able to function in society, hold a job and do various things. And um, losing that therapy um, made him homebound, have all the terrible tics that you can have and so on with Tourette's. And her, her, her goal was to try to figure out what we could do to to get this company to, to basically continue to make the therapy or, or develop the drug. Having had conversations with them, they basically um, blew her off, as she said to me very nicely. So she said that wasn't an acceptable answer. So she uh, went to her congressional leaders, and she happened to be from the state of Connecticut, in Connecticut, and then from there um, went to Washington. And uh, also, this was back in 1983 when there was no Internet. So it was really hard to to um, reach out to people as easily, you couldn't reach out to people as easily as you can now. But she, she did reach out to some of her friends, she went to some hospitals, other, thing, other things like that in, in Connecticut, and basically found that her problem was not unique, as a matter of fact. There were lots of people that were having the same kinds of issues. Companies that were working on with drugs that were in small populations that couldn't make the economics work would just arbitrarily decide to stop making the product. Then there was no therapy for the for the, their family members. So she basically um, pulled together this group of people, a large group of people that ultimately became Nord, and um, lobbied Congress in D.C. and um, worked very hard for three or four years and uh, put together 100,000 people that showed up in Washington on the steps of Congress and um, ultimately ended up getting the Orphan Drug Act passed in 1983. And then um, in January of 83, was standing on the uh, behind Reagan when he signed it. And um, so from a mom with a kid uh, who lost the therapy to standing on the, the steps while the Ronald Reagan signing this into law, um, had you know was was a real accomplishment, and so she stayed um, actively involved for 25 years, and then the board reached a point at which in 2008 that Abby was having some health issues. Number one, number two, she was truly sort of a mom. You know, it was it was a it was a mom and pop shop, and there was an opportunity to probably expand it and take it to a, a different level. And so the board made the decision they really wanted to try to see if they could find somebody that is, she was trying to retire that could come in and bring um, a, a different level of expertise to the organization, if you will. And so I ended up being the person that um, they recruited and been there for 10 years. I will say to you, came, thought I'd stay for five, um, have been there 10. Um, and we've sort of taken Nord from a small 
about a $4 million operation when I took it over. This year will be a $45 million operation. Um, we've gone from a website that was down 236 days the first year I was there, had about 250,000 people reaching us for looking for advice and guidance on orphan products, and last month we had 1.3 million people come to us. So we, we're, we're running at a rate of 16 to 17 million people a year now coming to us from 241 com countries, all looking for advice and uh, looking for how to get help or um, how to find a therapy, how to find a, a center that's doing research, how to answer any kind of question you can on, on orphans. So that's, that's sort of been the, the quick and dirty story of, of Nord and how it's grown. And I will say uh, to one of the comments that you made that one of the things that Abby did that was extremely good that I basically have, it's really sort of the IP of Nord, was that Abby did not have any industry or anybody that was making drugs that could influence what policy looked like um, on her board or involved in the organization. And so I think for me, one of the things I'm most proud of proud of is the fact that we've been able to maintain that integrity and maintain an organization that truly is seen by Congress as the voice of the rare disease patient. So I will say nothing happens in Washington without us sitting at the table. That's an extraordinary history and set of accomplishments. What's What's been the result? I mean, I, I know there's some numbers I've seen thrown around out there, but the number of, of orphan products now and the number in the pipelines. Do you have any, any sort of update on what's what's happened in the in the in that space the orphan drug act has been i think one of the most successful pieces of legislation um to date and we've done a lot of research on that and the numbers indicate that i mean there there are seven thousand rare diseases prior to the orphan drug act being passed in 83 there were 10 therapies that have been developed there are now 600 and i can't give you the exact numbers about 680 now appro fda approved therapies for um, rare disease patients. And I will tell you that we're on a trajectory this year for the agency, FDA agency, to approve probably 80 new therapies this year. So it has really worked. I mean, science has, has progressed, which has helped that, but the Orphan Drug Act has provided the incentives and the pathway to get companies um, the types of incentives necessarily necessary to, to get them to want to invest in um, smaller market size so they can recoup their recoup their investments. So what are the uh, the policy issues you and the, the Nord staff and board are dealing with now that are either uh, looking to help help the uh, Orphan Products Act or, or attack it? Or what, what are you seeing out there on the horizon? That's a great question. And I think I can tell you that over my 10 years, it's, um, it's really changed somewhat. When I first came to Nord, the biggest issue that industry and other people had was the FDA holding up the process and um, or allegedly holding up the process, uh, not approving dr drugs in an expedited fashion, if you will, and feeling like the FDA was um, a real problem. I've seen a tremendous switch in the last five years to the largest issue that we have right now is reimbursement. Uh, the FDA works fine. Lots of drugs coming through the pipeline, as I said, 70 to 80 this year. But the problem we're, we're really facing right now with the orphans is the fact that there's a perception that orphans are expensive, and they are, because they're, if, if you do the economics, if you're going to develop a therapy and there are a 1,000 patients and it ta takes on average a billion dollars to bring a product to market, if you do the simple economics, you have to charge a lot of money for that therapy. But then you have to remember that it's spread over a very small group of people, number of people. So the impact is not as large. So example. Nord has just done an, a bunch of research this past year with some outside firms to um, and just published the research um, in October of this year, 18, uh, indicating that the over, if you look at the overall drug spend in the United States, about $451 billion. Orphans make up 9% of that. So um, it's a very small portion of the overall drug spend. And as a matter of fact, our research indicates that drug pricing and the growth of uh, that pricing has been flat over the last three years. And while we're seeing a slight uptick now, but that's because science is changing, the genome is changing, things are coming to market much more quickly, um, we're still orphans are, are, are a very good business from a business perspective, um, and there's still a tremendous amount of need. 95% of the patients 
that we deal with right now don't have any approved therapy. So they're without anything. And so that's a real challenge and something that we are, you know, we're fighting for. Policy people in Washington um, are uh, not as well informed as they need to be. And so Nord sees that it's a major part of our job to do the the research and to um, to bring them the numbers. As a matter of fact, Nord has coined a new phrase called new advocacy um, this year that we're talking to everybody up on the hill about, which is we bring our advocates, we'll bring moms and pops, family members, and so on to tell their story about the issues of dealing with the disease. But we now bring empirical data talking about the cost and what that's really meant to those families. That when you have empirical data and a strong patient story, you can really uh, change behavior. And so Nord is spending an awful lot of time right now on its advocacy, bringing um, all sorts of empirical data with it. So uh, Congress needs to be educated because Congress reads things in sound bites um, out of the newspaper, and um, it's really important to be able to provide them um, empirical data so they can see actually how things really work. Uh, Peter, that, it, it's, it is uh, re- rewarding to hear everything that Nord is doing, certainly in terms of the overall issues of rare diseases. Uh, but I know that the, the overwhelming membership in Nord is individual patient advocacy groups, which are made up, obviously, of families and friends and people who care about individual diseases. What are the kinds of services that Nord provides for those organizations or the individuals in those organizations? We have right now about 280 disease-specific patient organizations that are qualified members of Nord. And when I say qualified members of Nord, you can't just uh, put your name on a list and become a member of Nord. You have to you have to have a scientific medical advisory committee. You can't be run just by a family organization. You need to have, it needs to be a true 501c3 organization. So we help those organizations uh, become organizations, if you will. So we have every, our membership looks like a mom and pop sort of at one end of the spectrum, all the way through to cystic fibrosis, which is a multi-billion dollar um, patient organization that's investing in science and, and research and, f- and funding research for, for cures. So it covers the gamut. So we do everything from incubate small groups, teaching them how to organize, how to get their 501c3. They can come under the Nord umbrella and use our 501c3 while they're learning um, to um, building. How do you build a board? How do you fundraise? All the things that an organization really needs to to know, to be able to thrive, to be able to be successful. And so we are, um, we have a full-time staff of people that do nothing but interface with these patient organizations and work with them at the various levels. And could you quickly describe the organization that helps them get the drugs and qualify for those through the insurance? That's a big effort of Nord, my understanding. Nord's built a grassroots um, organization that uh, is 50 states wide. We have we right now have 5,100 volunteers in all 50 states, with a key what we call an ambassador, who is our key volunteer leader in that state, who has mobilized all of these other um, advocates in the state, and um, that organization has been pulled together basically for four about four years now, where we really started to reemphasize this after the Affordable Care Act was passed. Um, a lot of the decisions around how people were accessing their therapies and how they were being paid for was being done was moved from federal level to the state level, and so the need for us was to have a, a, a broad based organization that could work at at state level. And right now, I will tell you that Nord is actively working on 203 pieces of legislation in all 50 states, okay? So it just tells you how important it is to have a strong grassroots organization with advocates who can either go to see the insurance commissioner, go see the Medicaid insurance person, go see the Medicare person, uh, go up and see the, the governor if that's important. Um, and all of this is coming out of a strategy that Nord built four years ago. We now have rare disease councils in 16 states, Um, We're continuing to grow those, and so Nord has put its footprint down now um, very aggressively across the country, and so even the state um, legislatures are now becoming very familiar with with Nord and with their advocates because – the rubber meets the road. The pricing is happening. The the decisions are being made by the insurance companies at the state level. So we're very similar now to sort of the European Union where it used to be member states. We have 50 states, but they're all sort of individual states uh, making their own decisions about uh, how they're delivering care and how they're paying for care. It's really gotten complicated. 
Let me bring it back to uh, sort of a, a more local thing at KGI. Uh, the, the KGI students have formed a, a Nord student chapter, which I guess is, uh, from my understanding, one of eight or nine that are around the country. What, what would you what would you tell them uh, about how they can get involved and what the kind of issues are uh, that they could uh, they could take on and and uh, and make a difference? Really good, another really good question. Um, I think that um, the students are the future. I mean, uh, candidly. We need more of those types of people actively involved early on, learning about what it takes to be not not only an advocate, but what it takes to get laws passed, what it takes to influence policy. Um, there's so much work that needs to be done from the lab through to the hill that um, we really encourage growing the student chapters now because our goal is to try to get the young people engaged, um, excited, and uh, motivated to want to play an active role um, going forward. So I, I see it as the it's the future of grassroots, and uh, it's the future it's the future leaders for us, candidly. And so we are trying to expand these groups more and more. So um, we're excited about what's happening with the student chapters. Th- thank you for that. I think uh, I think our students will be. Very rewarded to hear that. I know they're very excited about working with you and the uh, uh, the, the Nord staff, uh, Peter. L- l- let me let me ask you a couple uh, deeply personal questions, of course, because that's uh, it, it's that kind of a, a podcast. Uh, t- tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, you've been in this industry a while. Uh, I believe you started out in the healthcare industry in in New England. Uh, probably, I think, graduated from high school, so you've probably been in it a couple of years. So give us give us a little bit of your of your history and background and how you got into this. Yeah, without going back too far, I'll go back to I'll go back to the '80s, which is a long time long time ago, especially for some of the people that are listening. Um, I was recruited by um, a, a physician. Let me go back a little before that. I, I got out of college and be, went to Vietnam, came back from Vietnam, and ended up uh, becoming a stock and commodities broker and did that for a number of years and um, didn't find it terribly rewarding and ended up uh, at Yale University uh, as a development officer running the $370 million capital campaign for Yale back in the 70s. And so we we – um, raised a lot of money. And so I saw that I was good with people and um, that I could sell and uh, was recruited by the president of a Harvard teaching hospital to help them uh, merge three hospitals into what ultimately became Brigham and Women's Hospital. So myself and Dick Nesson and three or four other senior members of a team put Brigham and Women's Hospital together, which is, you know, when I reflect back and look at it now, quite an accomplishment. So I stayed at the Brigham for a number of years and then left to go run a smaller hospital in the, in the Boston area. And then my son, uh, my son, my, my brother, excuse me, um, ended up having, um, a son born at a hospital here in California, in California that had a medical error um, that was very preventable, um, and he's a quadriplegic because of the error. And, um, and, and it hasn't killed him, but he's a quadriplegic with you know, 24-7 care and um, can't, basically can't even feed himself. And so I was really distraught over that and was running a hospital, and every Monday we'd sit down and talk about all the things that had happened. Um, over the weekend in the hospital, and there were lots of there were lots of errors occurring um, back in the back in the eighties and nineties, and um, so I was really motivated to try to go solve that problem. So I left there and went over to the Harvard Risk Management Foundation, which was a, a foundation that looked at and managed all the risk for the Harvard hospitals, and there um, worked um, to help develop some software to measure the effectiveness effectiveness of the health care delivery process. And uh, ultimately left Harvard, started a company of my own called Safe Care Systems, and um, ended up s- developing that software, selling it to hospitals, and then knock, knock, the government came, knocked on our door and liked what we were doing and wanted to use our software. And so I sold the company to um, somebody who was somebody who had the capacity to be able to deliver on that. Um, and so with that, I um, rode off into the sunset for a little while and tried to decide what else I wanted to do and uh, did have medical, had some medical errors in my family, but also had some rare diseases in my family. I have two other rare diseases in my family. And so um, took about a month off and uh, decided that I really needed to be doing something again. So spoke to some good friends, one of whom was doing the search for 
for Nord and said to me, I've got this really interesting little organization. Your skill set might be just right. You're at the right time in your life. Maybe you'd want to do this. Looked at it, um, thought that it would be interesting to, to try to go do. And so um, ended up going to going to Nord and uh, the rest is history. Been there for 10 years now. And I think we really have built it into um, – a very strong national force right now. As I say, nothing happens in this community without us being at the table. We're very actively involved with the FDA, NIH, CMS, um, at all levels. So anything rare, um, Nord is at the table. And so we're in the midst of just getting ready to, we've been doing a review this year of the Orphan Drug Act. We're about ready to report it back to Congress in January. Um, not sure how that's going to go with the, with the current administration that we have. You really can't tell how anything's going to go. So we're going to wait and see um, how they respond. Uh, but I will tell you that I think um, orphans, again, um, are going to be under the microscope with a new Democratic Congress. Um, I met with Pelosi a couple of weeks ago, and she made it very clear. She thinks drug pricing is – drug prices are too high. Even, even though there may be small populations, drug prices are too high. Um, so I think we're going to see – uh, this coming year, real pressure on prices again, which is going to keep Nord in the forefront of making sure that the information that is accurate out there. And, um, you know, that I, I'm still going at it, loving it, and, um, you know, very energized by this. So we're going to continue to try to do everything we can to keep the patient uh, focus in front. Well, Peter, your enthusiasm and excitement and, and uh, positive attitude on the future, I think, is 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 an enormous factor of why Nord is is progressing. But let me ask you, you know, a lot of a lot of students are out there and will be listening to this, and uh, sometimes they get discouraged by what they hear about the future of the industry, uh, the future of healthcare, possibly uh, all kinds of price controls, whatever whatever it may be in terms of the future. Uh, you can frame that any way you choose. What, what advice would you tell them? What would you tell them about the future in this industry? You know, my, my philosophy is and always has been is that uh, I control my own destiny and I can shape the future somewhat. And so I think the experience at Nord has really demonstrated that we have been very good listeners. We pay a lot of attention to the market and what's going on. And then we, we identify key areas where we think it's crucial to be the major player. Then we go out and develop the data or the story or whatever it is to try to influence that future. And so um, I don't see healthcare as being any different than any place else. Else, Everything's challenged. There's always going to be an uphill battle. Um, it's just having the foresight to um, surround yourself with smart people so you can sit around the table, develop that right plan. And then um, I know our business fairly well. I know where the weak points are. Um, and so we're, we're doing everything we can to address those weak points. Are we going to win all those battles? No. But um, we certainly will win more than we lose, and we will, we will be resilient enough to be able to sort of bounce back. And uh, every time you get knocked down, we sort of sit down around a table and look at each other and say, okay, why? What happened? Where do we need to go? What's the real endpoint? What's the impact on the patient? How do we get there to solve that problem? And so, um, you know, my philosophy has always been to be that way. And so uh, my advice is to be tenacious, don't give up, believe in what you're, you know, you believe in, but, you know, also surround yourself. I mean, one of the most important things for me has been to really recognize what you do well and what you don't do well and not be afraid to recognize that. I will say when you asked me a question a few minutes ago about my growth experience, um, it, one one step in there, I took a job as a chief operating officer of a hospital, and I lasted 12 months and got fired. And the reason I got fired because I was not very good at being a chief operating officer because I really recognized that I'm not a detailed person. I'm more the idea and bigger picture guy. So once you recognize and are comfortable with that and you can surround yourself with people, I mean, at Nord right now, we have a fabulous management team that's made up of people that help fill in the void for the things that either I or some of the other senior managers can't do. And so it's really recognizing that the more smart people you put around the table, the better answer you're going to get. And you don't have to have all the answers. You do not have to have all the answers. And so you, as long as you're comfortable with that and can think strategically um, and can get up off the floor if they knock you down once, um, you know, that's the way we've been. That's the way we work. Uh, Peter, that's, that's obviously 
fabulous advice, hard to learn, and it obviously takes it takes it takes those experiences, to, I guess, to learn the lessons and to realize that uh, you can't know everything, nor should you. And I think uh, I can certainly say, and I guess I, I guess in terms of. Uh, uh, complete disclosure. I've I've been I I've, I've loved working with with Nord. I've been on the board for several years. I guess I can't even count the number of years these days. Uh, I've been vice chair for for several years, and it's been a real thrill to work uh, with Nord and and see what you folks are, what you folks, us folks, what we have have been able to accomplish in terms of of um, you know really providing the things that rare disease patients uh, so desperately need. L- let me let me ask by saying, what, what do you see as the biggest challenge? Uh, these days, in terms of uh, providing more more drugs for uh, rare disease patients or more therapies, I guess. I think the science is. I, I'm excited that the science is really progressing. Um, the, with the genome, um, just we're seeing. You know, we're seeing cures coming right now. I mean, I'm on the. I'm on a on one of the uh, FDA's. Um, task forces that's looking at gene therapies, and I'm the patient representative, and I sat in a meeting a few weeks ago under full disclosure here, and we'll say to you that I saw a therapy that's going to uh, cure blindness in kids that they showed some kids, and it was just, it was, it was, it put you in tears. I mean, you just, the life-changing impacts, and that science wasn't available 10 years ago, five years ago. So we're seeing tremendous, um, tremendous growth in science. So I think that science... My, the biggest concern I have right now for all of us in the in this space is that the science is growing at a very rapid pace, yet the reimbursement system um, is still built around actuaries who look 18 months out and don't know how to price things. Um, as long as you have that divergence, um, you're going to have complications and issues in the space and lots of tension. And so I think the largest issue that we're facing right now is the issue around trying to get – we're seeing therapies be approved, put in the formularies, and then patients not be able to access them because payers won't pay for them. And that's a crime. That's a crime. If somebody's done the work, invested the billion dollars, gone through all the clinical trials, gotten it approved, and it's in the formulary, then people should have access to it. And we need to figure out the pricing, the pricing scenario. And it's not easy, but it's going to take a long dialogue, and Nord wants to be at the table to be part of that conversation. So we are looking at some of these value pricing models that are out, that are out there right now and, and, and some other some other models. But I think the biggest challenge right now is the science is there, but getting them paid for and getting the patients to be able to have access to them is going to be a real issue. And then on top of that, the whole congressional issue, I mean, Congress Congress has a very short attention span. And um, I've been doing this for a lot of years, and I spend a lot of time on the Hill, and people are not informed, and they read news bites, and they form an opinion based upon those news bites. It's really important for places like Nord and other organizations to make sure that we're providing the factual data so that decisions that are being made about the future of drug development and drug pricing is based on fact and not emotion. And so I think that's, that's, that's critical for us right now. So I see that, that providing that data for the factual decisions and then the pricing issue is probably the two largest issues that we're facing right now. Uh, Peter, it is, it, I mean, I think you have absolutely nailed the the, uh, the the biggest problem out there is is access because uh, the science is roaring ahead at this incredible pace uh, and uh, you know I think so the the only issue I think people will take issue with you uh, is gee are there only seven thousand rare diseases I think that the new genetic information is going to make that number just go to some 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 big number who knows it probably two x of that in, in terms of uh, the opportunity and, and virtually everyone is going to be affected by at some point a rare disease and this issue of of access uh, and, and the cost is going to be going to be one that's going to face us for a long, long time and going to really be difficult to, to challenge. I should say that the, just this afternoon, we had a, a Shark Tank uh uh, event with our pharmacy students, with our second year pharmacy students, and it was—it's just sort of almost jarring to to be here, to be here this afternoon and talk to you about these this this huge issue, uh, and at the same time they were talking about coming up with technologies just to make it so people could have access to a medication in a pharmacy, and it seems to me that those two things are just 
sort of crazy ends of a uh, of a problem that we really as a society have to deal with. So, you know, while those things are obviously, uh, you know, challenges and things that we don't like to see, uh, I view them as opportunities for our students and to work together with, with you and with Nord and to, to work together to, to solve these, uh, these really vexing problems that uh, affect people's lives every day. So on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you. We're thrilled to have you here at KGI. We're looking forward to, to uh, seeing the whole board of, of Nord at, uh, on our campus the next couple of days, and we're looking forward to uh, much closer interactions. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's exciting to be here, and um, I do want to encourage the students, don't give up. I mean, you all are the future, and um, we need your intellect, we need your, your brains, we need your, your thought processes to help us um, basically solve the pro- this access problem because, you're, you, Shelley, you're right. It is the one and only biggest problem right now. Thank you, Peter. <laughs>